All right, welcome back everybody to another episode of Making Monsters. We're continuing on the off-season series. Uh, we've had several questions so far. We've got a little bit of all the Windy City guys and girls, me, um, involved in this and really kind of in-depth look at the roster and what we think the roster looks like heading into camp. There's obviously some battles that we'll be looking at in camp too. Maybe that'll be my next question. I don't know. But today we're joined by Brian Orinchuk. Brian, this is... Uh, contributor to Windy City Gridiron, but we I just found out we grew up like down the street from each other. <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. So um, thanks yeah, for yeah. hopping on with me. Today, we are going into ranking our positional group. So I want people to keep in mind when we're talking about this, we're not just looking at that a one or two person type of thing. We want to look at the whole positional group and its value as a whole um, and in the roster comparatively to some of the other ones. So for the rest of the questions, Brian, I started at number one. We worked our way from there. But I think with this one, the conversations with the ones towards the bottom of our list may have a little bit more to be said than maybe some of those obvious top one, two, threes for a lot of people. So Let's start there. What is your biggest concern when it comes to this roster? And I mean that as just your, I guess, number 11. And by the way, to let people know, too, we broke up defensive line and edge, but then offensive line is just one. We did not break up tackles, guard, center, anything like that. So it's just offensive line as a whole, but then we did break up defensive tackles and edge. So what do you have as your bottom, your number 11 when it comes to the position group for this roster? So I have DTs. Um, and the, the good thing about this, I think is, um, our GM polls has done a good job of infusing young talent. So there's a lot of potential here, mm -hmm. but, um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of tough to depend on, on that young unproven talent. So, um, DT is, is the, the, uh, area of most concern for me. Um, we lost Justin Jones. Um, you know, he was kind of a, uh, a mercenary vet, you know, nothing special, uh, but he did have four and a half sacks, 10 tackles for loss and 17 QB hits last mm -hmm. year. Um, and I, I really do like um, Jervon Dexter senior. I think he could step in and, and fill some of that. Um, I, I loved his last seven games. He had two and a half sacks. Uh, he yeah. had nine QB hits in just his last seven games. Um, no TFLs. Um, I, I think that might change. Obviously, we have Billings coming back, huge run stopper. He also does push the pocket on passing downs, uh, yeah. but you know, you kind of know what you're getting with him. Um, I love Billings. Um, I'm really excited about Dex, um, and and I'm eager to see what Pickens does uh, this year. Zach Pickens, you know, he he hovered around 25, 30 percent snap count last year. Um, didn't really show up on the stat sheet much. Uh, he's got a lot of potential. I liked him in South Carolina. Um, so you know, you're leaning on Dexter. And and Pickens is going to be you know critical for us, and and that's kind of why this um, lands at uh, the, the last spot for me on our rankings. Yeah, and I, for me, I went back and forth between like the tenth and eleven being defense our, our interior defensive line, the defensive tackles, and the edge. Uh, I kept going back and forth of which one I was most concerned for. Um, the reason I have edge as my number 11, the one that I'm most concerned about is just because I feel like it's almost just Montez Sweat. Uh, I get Demarcus Walker has created pressure in certain situations and maybe, and like I said, this is before camp too. There's no other help right now other than pretty much that. It's going to be just Demarcus Walker on one side and Montez Sweat on the other. We will see a lot of rotation. That's one thing with Iberflus and what he likes to do on his defense. We see, you know, we'll see Javon Dexter on the outside sometimes. You'll see things kind of get moved around a little bit. Demarcus Walker's really good on the interior and so that's, um, I kind of wish we had somebody opp opposite Montez so we could put Demarcus Walker there because I do think yeah. that would solidify the interior a little bit more. Um, but I do have a lot of concerns when it comes to that the, the pass rush from the outside, and it's highly concerning to me. I know what Montez can do. I've also seen multiple charts of like his double team rate, and he, although he's able to push through a lot of that, um, it would be nice to have someone take a little bit of of that away. We will see young guy Austin Booker. I think Austin Booker eventually has the potential to be a starter on on at, at an edge on the soft, on the defensive line. But to me, at this point, it's going to take. He's pretty raw. It's going to take some time right. for him to get in. I think he's going to be a, a massive third down type of guy for a while, and eventually they'll work him in a little bit more. So right now, to me, at this moment, they're counting on Demarcus Walker being able to get some pressure from the outside. That's the only reason that I have him over – the defensive tackles for me, that interior, because they are the defensive tackles I have as 10. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, similar to me as well. Um, I, I think uh, what really uh, um, turned the corner for me was Walker's last, uh, I think it was last four games of the year. After Yannick Ngakwe got hurt and he got back, you know, his chance to start, um, you know, that's when he we saw him move inside a little bit more at three tech and, and cause some disruption. Um, he had two sacks, four TFLs and seven QB hits in just the last four games. So, yeah. You know, and it's one of those things, too, Taylor, where we're still so young into this regime with Poles and Flus. You know, as Bears fans, we have become jaded by by the front office and the coaching staff and their ability to develop young talent and what they what they trust and who they, you know, uh, um, put in these positions uh, of of great uh, opportunity and how it never, never pans out. So I'm kind of, you know, holding out hope for a guy like Walker or those young D tackles, like we talked about. Um, and maybe the front office and the coaching staff see something we don't, you know, we have in all these positions that we just talked about, you know, you have um, Eric Washington, that's going to come and, and, and yeah. you know, influence their game too. So what's that going to be, but um, it, it's pretty cool to see, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll hear more about it throughout the night, but you know, there's so much more potential and, and better, um, optics in the rest of the positions than we've seen in a long time. So this was kind of a tough list, which it usually was, it was tough for the, on the other side, everything was yeah. bad before, but now we have a lot of solid positions, good potential. And um, so it's, it's looking up for, for bears fans for sure. I know that's a couple things that I thought about as I was making the list. I was like, this is way more difficult at the top than it used to be. Like I remember yeah. making monsters when I started it two years ago and making that, I remember we kind of did a similar thing and I was like, oh, like, I don't even know. I, I guess quarterback at the top and I, right. at that time it's still Roquan. So you put linebackers up there because of Roquan. Right. But there was a whole lot of question marks on that roster from top to bottom. And so that has definitely shifted. And then to your point, too, of the drafting and being able to kind of realize that this the, the regime looks like it's turned a corner on something that they've struggled with a long time. Ryan Pace put the Bears in a really bad spot when it came to drafting. Um, and free agency, honestly, he spent money on some guys and not saying they weren't all bad because they obviously got guys like a, well, more Cleo Mack was a trade. But he, there was yeah. some every now and then that he'd get in free agency or in the draft that you were like, OK, this is pretty good. But the problem is he always gave up stuff for right. those. We, in return, are using Carolina's picks to get a quarterback and using Carolina pit, Carolina's picks to get guys. Yes. Thank you, Lovey. Um, and so I even today was thinking about it and I was going back and looking at the, the draft since Ryan Poles took over and the amount of starters that he's gotten out of three, let's just say two drafts. Cause we're waiting, obviously this one's TBD. Right. At the moment, Roma Dunze is going to be starting and Caleb Williams is going to be starting. Right. So when you look at it and you look at Jaquan Brisker and Kyler Gordon and Tyreek Stevenson and Javon Dexter and, um, Braxton Jones and the list of guys that you can go on about that are starters on this roster or even pretty solid rotational pieces when it comes to a Zach Pickens that you're counting on, um, a Roshan Johnson that you're counting on to kind of take a step this year. And so there, it's wild to see the difference that this has flipped. And so that's why, yes, it's it was such an interesting list to make. Um, this time around. And I know some people are going to probably be mad at my number nine, um, which I think most of us kind of had this around this time frame. Uh, but nine for me is quarterback. I think that we still have to see Caleb Williams. We still have to see how quickly for he sure. adjusts to the NFL, what he looks like in this offense. You're giving him all the opportunity in the world. Uh, you're hoping that the offensive line's fixed. You have a solid run game to help him out in those situations. You have multiple tight ends that he could go to in Shane Waldron's offense, of which he loves, multiple receiving weapons that you can go to. But you still have to see it. You have to see it on the football field. And then also behind that, I'm not sure uh, Tyson Bajan or Austin Reed or Rippin would be a starter on any other roster or even close to that. So to me, that's why the quarterback sits that low for me. Yeah. We're, we're, we're super close neck and neck. Um, and really for me, the, the reason why I have QB just one spot ahead of my nine is because of what Tyson did in his, in his starts and he went two and yeah. two, he, he proved to be, and that's another thing, the UDFAs that polls has acquired, yeah. right? Not even draft picks. They've been contributors. They have, they have really been pleasant surprises made the team. You think of Jack Sanborn, who's going to, you know, who's, who's impacted this list further on up, you know, another UDFA that we had, you know, and, and that a lot of people, especially on WCG have been talking about, um, the, the UDFAs that might make an impact to the positions we just talked about yeah. at DT and edge. So 
anyway, I love Bajan. I think, I think, you know, having Caleb there uh, and his potential, I think this is going to be the lowest spot that quarterbacks at because of, you know, him being a rookie, but I totally yeah. get and validate, you know, you putting uh, them ahead of or behind um, your, your number eight spot. Uh, for me, number nine is my, is O-line. Um, okay. I'm very happy with the swapping of Bates and Shelton for Cody and Lucas. Uh, very happy with that. Um, you got younger, you got better, a little more versatile at this point in their careers. Um, Nate Davis, obviously still a question mark for me. I, I really liked his signing, but he, he had a tough year. I think he'll bounce back. A lot of these offensive linemen I'm optimistic um, about yeah. and, and, and their opportunity to bounce back, but it's still kind of a question mark. Uh, Braxton Jones, you know, he had that extremely healthy and durable first year. Last year, not so much. Still kind of struggling with penalties a little bit. Same with Tevin. Uh, Tevin is probably my favorite player on the team. I know he's one of yours. And, yeah. and I think he can be a dominant guard in this league. Um, but if he can stay healthy, um, yeah. obviously he finished on a low note and he admitted it with the, the Packers game, played one of his worst games ever. Um, yeah. So a lot of potential here as well. I think we have better depth than we've had in the past, but there's still a concern overall for me on O-line. So they they chalk in at number nine, but quarterback is, is just ahead of them. Good enough for you. And yeah, and so we flopped those. It's funny, we flopped both. So yeah. um, I have edge, defensive tackle, quarterback, offensive line. You have defensive tackle, edge, offensive line, quarterback. Right. Um, and so same, same mindset when it comes to me for the offensive line. If you're not out there, you're, you're, you can't play and the, you can't play well. And when you have a guy like Tevin Jenkins, who can be one of the best guards in the league, but has not been able to be on the field for a full season his whole time, I'm going to mark that position group for that. And it goes for also Nate Davis. Nate Davis missed a ton of time last year. And honestly, when he was in, there were moments Darnell Wright looked like the veteran next to Nate Davis. Yeah. And it, that, it, that was shocking because uh, along with you, I was actually pretty excited about that signing when the Bears got Nate Davis. And right. it just hasn't looked like it panned out. Um, I do think that's a large reason, though, that Ryan Poles went and got Ryan Bates and Shelton Coleman because both those guys can play pretty much anywhere on the interior. So yeah. I'm guessing it's going to be Ryan Bates at center and you have Ryan uh, Coleman Shelton to kind of rotate if you need them, which so far the last few years we've needed somebody to come yeah. in and replace guys. Uh, we'll see. That's one of the battles we'll be looking at is that center position of which one of those guys take that and the other one will be a swing is what we're we're kind of predicting. Um but yeah, I think that Braxton Jones, I posted something yesterday and it was just it, the pass block win rate and the run block, well, run block and pass protection. Yeah. Um, he was in the top 10 for both of those through right. at last season. Um, I think we've steadily seen Braxton increase and get better. There's still things that he does need to work on. And like you said, penalties being one of them, the bears were had, I want to say the most holding penalties in the league last year um, by the offensive line. That can't happen. You cannot constantly push your team backwards and uh, so that has to change. I know he struggles against the bull rush at times, too. So that's something that I know he's also mentioned about getting stronger and being able to handle those situations. Um, but that's why to me, I just think I, I think that if those starting five are on the field, they're a really solid offensive line. The big question mark is, can they be on the field? Right. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Same page. And, and like I said, I'm really optimistic I, based on the flashes I've seen when they're healthy, when they, you know, are their heads right. Like Nate Davis had the terrible uh, trauma with his, with his mother passing last year. Yeah. Um, I just feel, and he's, he's has tape in this league, which is why we got him that he can, he can produce. Um, and then Ryan Bates, you know, as far as his tape playing guard and center, like these guys can play, but you know how it is with offensive lines. They have to really have that time healthy to get, uh, you know, moving in one accord and, and get on the same page. And I think if our guys can do that, then it'll be a strength of our team uh, for sure. So I'm excited about that. Who do you yeah, have? Or I, what do position? Think, oh, I do think just sorry to that, like, because I think in an underrated point to when we even talk about Braxton is and Tevin. Tevin's had to play almost every single spot on the offensive line since he's been in. And that's also dealing with injury. Braxton Jones has played next to like four or five different left guards yeah, because true. no one can stay healthy there. So it's been cut. We've seen Cody Whitehair. We've seen um, I forgot his name. Uh, Tyre Slaughter, I think maybe. Yeah, Tyre was there for a little bit. Obviously, Lucas Patrick, but there was another one that I forgot about, and Lester reminded me. Um, I can't remember. I'll think of it in a second. But yeah, so he's played by multiple people too. And to your point, right. you're not going to get any sort of rhythm or comfortability and working together and nice. for your quarterback either. And it, it sucks for Justin Fields that he never had any sort of consistency in front of him because he never got the opportunity to develop behind anything that had any sort of 
a consistent foundation. But let's go to seven. What is seven for you? Seven, I got safety. And and this is this is where it gets really tough for me because I'm yeah. I'm extremely happy with the rest of these positions, uh, yeah. safety included. Um, I think I do think we got better tr- trading out Bayard for Bayard. Bojack. I do think we do at this stage of Bojack's career. And I, I'm a huge Eddie Jackson fan, uh, mm-hmm. but he just was not the same player. Um, yeah. I think Bayard added to the mix and, and Brisker has talked about this. There's going to be some interchangeability about or with the safeties now. It's not going to be a free safety, strong safety. It's really yep. left and right sides. They can both do both things, you know, creep up to the box or fall back. And I think that actually should improve Brisker's, uh, his, his uh, uh, performance this year. Uh, mm-hmm. But how much does Bayard have left in the tank? You know, his, his year last year was a kind of a down year. I think he's still a short tackler. I think that's going to be huge. Uh, yep. But can, can he, you know, roam center field and can he – be that field general back there with those with those young DBs. That's to be seen. Um, yeah. You know, Brisker. I, I love Brisker. Same thing with him though. Can he stay healthy? Um, yeah. Can he stay healthy? Uh, Bill Zimmerman on on Windy City. He had a great article and talked about some of his struggles in, in uh, coverage and uh, how he was ranked. Um, he had a, a over a hundred passer ranking or passer rating on him. Was ranked fifty third out of all safeties according to PFF. Um, you know, he's shown flashes as well. Uh, but can he and, and maybe there's some, you know, continuity issues there because Eddie Jackson missed some games, too. And um, yeah, but the one thing I do love about this group is Jonathan Owens. I think he might be the under underrating signing, yeah. uh, underrated signing of our offseason. Um, you know, this is the guy that started a lot of games. He collected over 100 tackles one year with the Texans. Um, you know, he's a stud, I think, as a backup. And yeah. uh, I think we would be in good hands, similar to like we felt with um, DeAndre Houston Carson back in the day when yeah. our starter goes down and he steps up. Um, you mm-hmm. know, I'm, I'm excited about that. So I like our safeties, but there's some questions there about Byard's continuation, about Brisker's uh, improvement, and then how much Owens, our backup, is going to be dependent on. Yeah, and I have safety at seven also. I'm a big Jaquan Brisker fan, um, and I do think that I've talked to a lot of people by, about this now, about the change of defense and how they're going, the safeties are going to be looking, like you said, kind of a little more free flowing rather than the the true free and strong. And I do think it's going to benefit Jaquan. The the thing with Jaquan Brisker is he's a guy that is able to, he can obviously, he can obviously spot the ball. That's one thing we saw his rookie season almost immediately is his ability to, he was the sack leader. He was able anytime someone he was good against the run. He led in sacks. He had his hands on the ball all the time. And so that's something that I think you saw him be able to have moments in that rookie season. I mean, you didn't see it as much last season. And I think it is because they kind of were like, here's your place. Here's your place when it comes to Eddie and Jaquan. And now it does get to open up a little bit more. Um, I did. I also did like the Kevin Byard signing to your point how much do you get out of Kevin Byard? The one good thing is number one, he's never missed a game ever yeah, in his career. Yeah. Um, and he also, like you said, when it comes to missed tackle rate far better than Eddie Jackson was. Uh, yeah. I too, I have an Eddie Jackson Jersey hanging in my closet. Yeah. I was an Eddie fan. Um, but after 2018, it was a little bit of a decline. And we thought when you put him back to the, the, his true free safety spot, it would come back. And it just never really got back to the level you wanted. There's a reason he's kind of still hanging out in free agency. It's not just because um, of the Bears secondary. So to all your same points, I honestly forgot about Jonathan Owens until like a week ago and someone posted a clip of him and I was like, oh, totally forgot. And yeah. yes, I think that's a fantastic. And there's other guys that they were able to, uh, Jalen Jones has came in in moments and been able to be decent in certain mm-hmm. situations when he needed to. I know last year when Elijah Hicks is out there, it seems to be kind of a disaster. So it's going to be, hopefully you don't have to get to that part of the depth chart. And that's why they are a little mm-hmm. lower for me um, because I am high on Brisker and Bayard, that combination. Yeah. Uh, it, it will be, I think the secondary in, fun, in, in general, healthy and if things click the way they're supposed to can be a top secondary if you're counting safeties and, and corners together. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Um, so next I, love, year, I love the young talent there. Just got to say the young talent oh, yeah. we have there is overall DBs is, is, is exciting. Uh, but yeah, what do you got? Number six. Oh, real quick too. Um, So Michael Schofield was the other guy that oh, played right. left guard. He, and so in Braxton's rookie season, he had to play by like three different, next to three different guys. Um, But yeah, so my number six, I actually have special teams here. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that 
when you have a guy like Tory Taylor, people judge that pick. I was ecstatic when they got Tory Taylor. He's fantastic. I think with the new kickoff rule, um, it could also change some things up. We could see him out there a lot more too in those situations. And he's a big guy. Um, he's able to, we've seen the way he can pin the ball inside. I, most people are like, just pin the ball in the 10. Like he can do it inside the five with that with right. ease. It looks like, and it's insane right. to watch. Um, Kyra Santos, obviously we've seen, we saw a little, a couple seasons ago, uh, a hiccup moments where he missed a few in a row. He addressed it himself and was like, look, I'm moving. So he moved the hash mark where he's been lining up. And since then you feel like Cairo almost doesn't miss. Um, and this is in a city like Chicago where it's windy and he's playing in torrential downpour and all of these other weather factors and he's still able to do it. So I'm really high on Cairo. I'm really high on Tory Taylor, obviously Patrick scales. He's someone we've talked about for a long time. It's just like the dude, he's the, the veteran. He's been around forever. He's fantastic. He has his little dance moves when things, when things go his way. Um, the, and, and then when you talk about return guys, that's going to be an interesting thing for me. Uh, with the new kickoff rule, you can have two returners down there. Um, is it going to be a Pettis and a Valus? Are we going to see these two be able to feed off of each other? I know a lot of people hear the word Valus Jones and are like cringe a little bit. Let me just remind people that's punt returns where he's muffed them. I know we right. saw a couple <laughs> drop passes, but Valus in college was absolutely phenomenal when it came to returning kicks. And I think that this new format, it fits – running back style way more and Bayless I think does have closer to the running back style over wide receiver style we saw the Bears last year towards the end of the season even throw him in um in the backfield a couple times when it came to being able to run the ball so I have special teams right in the middle to me they're one of those ones that I think if Tory Taylor is what we think he's going to be you could even argue them higher than that yeah, well, same. Similar to Caleb Williams as far as being a rookie in the unknown, so you can't put him too high. But I'm super high on Torrey Taylor. I think he's going to be a huge upgrade over Gill, and I and I I like Gill. Um, seemed like an awesome kid. Uh, but yeah, same same page. And I actually am really excited about Velas. Um, yeah. And, and even in the league, I think his kick return average, you know, last year was 27. Uh, over 27 yards a return. I mean, he he had one of the the better averages, but because of the old rules, he didn't get as many opportunities. Well, that's going to change. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I also think it's it's underrated what they've done with the competition with DeAndre Carter and um, and then bringing Pettis back and yeah. who are they? You know, I'm sure Roshan's going to be um, chopping Thanks at the bit to get back there and 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 make a mark. So I think the competition back there is is going to help him as well. But yeah, I'm excited about our special teams for sure. Yeah. Is that was that your next two? It was. Okay. Yeah. All right. Our yes. lists are very similar. Um, okay. So let's go with you. What's your five? Number five. Um, this is another one that was real close, uh, but I got running backs. Uh, okay. Running backs at number five, really high on our backs this year. Um, I was um, based on, on our depth chart before the off season with having Khalil Herbert come back, who I'm a big fan of having Roshan come yeah. back who I'm a big fan of. Um, I was thinking we, we might go after a guy like a Tony Pollard, a more mm -hmm. of a third down threat, uh, more of a, a speed quick back. And, and they did that with DeAndre Swift. I really like Swift. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm eager to see what he does against his former team, our divisional rival, the Lions. You know how we kind of swapped backs there. Yeah. But I do think I think Swift has shown that he's a dynamic athlete and playmaker uh, all three downs. Um, and and uh, and then, you know, Herbert is one of the most efficient backs in the league. He's in a contract year. He is going to yeah. be. Um, you know, ready to go and 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 um, real motivated. And then you have Roshan, who's just a hardworking, humble kid. We got three guys, and that's not even talking about Travis Homer or yeah. or we have what's it Wheeler, the the undrafted uh, rookie that we have. Rookie, we got yeah. a, a solid stable of backs right now, and uh, and I'm excited about them because I think I think they're going to be heavily leaned upon. Yeah, so I'm on the same page when I I was close for me. I I personally was going back and forth between tight end and running back here, mm -hmm. um, and it was really really hard. It was very difficult for me to choose between these two. I ended up going five tight end. I love Cole Komet. I'm also a Notre Dame fan, so Cole oh, Komet. Wow. It's just like my dream scenario to have somebody come from Notre Dame and actually be good and play for the team. Um, and so I I think he's fantastic. He they paid him last year for a reason. A lot of people want to criticize it a little bit, but when you look at the way the offense was last season, the if you look at the top teams, like the other tight ends that sit at the top, aside from the Baltimore tight ends, every other quarterback 
and that team and tight end threw half them out. Chicago did. And that's what a lot of people I don't think took into account. The Bears offense did not throw the ball often. They ran the ball like crazy. So there wasn't as many opportunities to get Cole Komet out there because they were rushing. They, I want to say it was like team total a little over 500 times they throw the ball. When you look at leaders in the league, it was high 600, 700 times that these that teams were throwing the ball. So it's a drastic difference when you look at it like that. And he was still right. able to sit at the top in yards, sit at the top in touchdowns. Um, there's certain things that Komet has had to improve on during the last few years, and I feel like we've seen him improve mm -hmm. on all of that, including blocking. Blocking was kind of a thing we criticized him on for a while. We saw moments last year where there's massive improvement in that. Um, so that's fun. And then the, the addition of Gerald Everett. Gerald Everett, I think, was like just such a – surprise signing first of all when it happened i was like whoa this is kind of crazy but fantastic it works perfectly with what shane Waldron likes to do with his tight ends and um i, I think that he's he's a fantastic route runner he's a little bit better uh, a blocker too so you can see that aspect getting added in and then you have mercedes lewis who's just a 19 year veteran he's consistent when it comes to like what he needs to do you're not going to see him have seven touchdowns, but you're going to see him in many aspects of the game. One thing Shane Waldron really likes to do is when he does use the two tight end sets to set up play action and other sort of things like that, I think Mercedes Lewis will be a, a big factor in those type of things. So to me, that tight end was five um, just because I think that I like, to your point, I like the, I love the running back group so much that I, it was just barely where it was like very difficult for me, but I do think I like the running back group as a whole of what all of them can do a little bit more than the tight ends, but I still am yeah. very excited about the tight end group. Yeah. Same page. These were really a toss up for me. <laughs> um, I love Komet and I love his overall game and, and you're right. We didn't pass as much last year and, and um, he was leaned upon a lot to, to block. You know, we, we used him as a fifth O lineman or sorry, six O lineman. And, um, and the same thing, Mercedes Lewis, I think, um, I just love him. He's a stud as well, a dependable third option. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm I'm super high on Gerald Everett. I think you know he's a he's a dynamic athlete um, that uh, we haven't had. We thought maybe Tunyon was going to be him, uh, yeah. but Tunyon didn't really he didn't really step up that way. And I so I think this is going to be more of what we were hoping to get with maybe a little higher ceiling even uh, last year. Um, so I, I I really like tight ends, but like you said, they, they could go either way. So uh, yeah. I'm right there with you. But but I had I had uh, running backs and then tight end. Tight ends, yeah. And so mine was flopped. I had tight end then running back, and same pretty much same reasons uh, that you did. I'm a big Khalil Herbert. I'm a big Juice fan. I think he's fantastic when it comes to um, yards after contact. When it comes to forcing missed tackles, Herbert's always along the top in the league when it comes to those couple things. And DeAndre Swift just even adds to that. You want to see him healthy. He had probably his best career year last year. Um, yeah. You want to see that continue. Uh, Roshan Johnson, I want to see fit in more. And the reason because, to your point, Khalil Herbert's in a contract year. So are you going to give Khalil Herbert money and give him another contract? Or does Roshan prove enough this season where you feel like you don't have to and now you have a rookie running back to kind of be behind Swift the next couple of years and take over the roles? But, yeah, the, the running back room I think is going to be fun. A lot of It's interesting to me because I see, you know, all the PFF rankings and they have the wide receivers, of course, and certain other aspects of the Bears roster. And nobody has the running backs. And I'm like, it's very interesting that a team that led the league, and I get you're losing a quarterback that rushes for the amount that Justin yeah. did. But the way the offensive line clearly was way better at run blocking and they were able to run the ball so well that you don't have them. It's just interesting, but we'll see. So let's go on to number three. My number three, I had linebackers. Um, and this is where we get to the point. I think that our whole group, pretty much all of Wendy City Gridiron had wide receiver, cornerback, linebacker in one, two, three in some Top form. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that Lester may have been the only one. I think Lester had linebackers at one possibly, but everybody else I think had wide, wide receiver at one, um, which that was just a little spoiler, but linebacker for me at number three, I love our linebacking room. Yeah. Um, TJ Edwards, fantastic. I think that TJ Edwards is going to get more and more attention throughout the league. People finally started noticing how big of a part he was to this defense last year. I mean, he led or sat in the top five for tackles the pretty much the entire year. I think he ended up at like seventh or so, but he's just, He's so good. And there were certain things that you wanted to see him maybe get a little better in coverage. He started getting better in coverage towards the end of the season. And I do think it took a little bit of time for him and Tremaine to get on the same page because early in the season, you were seeing some kind of funky things happening. And then towards the end of the season, it looked like they had been playing together for years. Um, right. So Tremaine Edmonds, a lot of people were criticizing that. And I get it because the Bears paid 
a lot of money. He's the highest paid player on the roster right now, um, being Tremaine Edmonds. But Tremaine Edmonds, what I think a lot of people don't know, had the lowest passer rating allowed of linebackers in the league that were targeted at least 30 times. And people just didn't throw to Tremaine. And that's what towards him. Like his side of the field was so avoided. And yep. that's put so much more on TJ too, uh, which he was able to handle it. And then obviously Jack Sanborn. We, I think that Sanborn, when Tremaine did go out last season because he was inactive a couple games, got injured, missed a couple games, Sanborn came in and you didn't feel any sort of drastic decline um, because Sanborn's able to kind of fit in with whatever he's asked to do. Uh, so I think it's really fun. We didn't get to see uh, Noah Sewell a ton last season, um, but I still, even if you're looking that deep into the depth chart, I still think you have a solid option there at linebacker four. Yeah, no, fully agree. Fully agree. I I, um, I also think it's crazy, you know, how how underlooked Edmonds' season went. You talked about the coverage. And and he had four picks. He yeah. Had four picks from middle linebacker position. Um, yeah. Really should have had five against that Viking game. They, I think they made it a fumble recovery. But, yeah. um, you know, he – The Cleveland he, one was a pick six in Cleveland, right? Yeah, pick six yeah. in Cleveland. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a huge play. Um, yeah. And so, like you said, I think I think it's going to take time for him to get used to playing next to Edwards. Um, I think it's going to take time for him to play behind some of these young D linemen, too. Yeah. I think that's a huge thing there. Um, but he also had, I want to say, like at least four or five TFLs as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, I love his coverage in, against running backs, too. Um, yeah. And then Sam Bourne, you know, Mr. Reliable out there. I think um, having him as a, as a third option, you know, we can when we go uh, on an even front and, and have those four down linemen and then the three backers. I just super confident. You know, I, I love our linebackers and, and look forward to seeing them continue to grow together for sure. Yeah, and I, I think this is another – the linebacker group, I feel like, in Chicago is one where you almost expect it to be one of the better ones. And when it's not, you're yeah. like, hold on, what's going on? So when being. things kind of looked – even with Ropon, it was looked like it was not very good for a couple of years. And then really quickly, Ryan Foles was able to turn something around and – People lost their minds over losing Roquan Smith, and then he was able to get two guys for the price of Roquan that I, I, when you look at TJ Edwards' numbers, he was right there with Roquan Smith. Um, didn't have as many sacks, but everything else was right there. And to your point, when you talk about the, the defensive line and how little they did help, when you have a team who had – some of the fewest sacks in the league and the fewest pressures in the league that puts a lot more pressure on your linebackers, puts a lot more pressure on your secondary. So that's what we're hoping this defensive line uh, is able to add some more up front because it does help all levels once it starts to trickle back. Um, yeah. So number two for me, and I think also you two is corner. Yep. Corner. Okay. So I, again, I, now we're to the point of the roster. Where I'm just like, I love them. I love them. <laughs> I love all yep. of these people. Super I think, deep. yes, Jalen Johnson, Fantastic. Obviously, he is a leader on the team. He's I think black, the biggest criticism for a while was like, can he get those interceptions? Could he get the hands on the ball? Can he bring one down? He did last year. He proved to you that he's able to do that. Um, he's just that guy. He's all over the field. He's so reliable. People don't want to get the ball anywhere near Jalen Johnson. Right. And uh, and that is, I guess, beneficial. Um, and to pull on to the next guy, when you look at a guy like Tyreek Stevenson, because no one wanted to throw at Jalen, yeah. Tyreek Stevenson had, I want to say, top three targets in the league, like 113 right. targets last season because everyone was just throwing. Dude handled it. And I think this is one of the best things that could have happened last year is he has so much experience in just one year um, because of how much they were targeting him. And it was a rough patch in the beginning. Towards the end of the season, Tyreek Stevenson was fantastic. He looked he looked so comfortable. Uh, we talked about that Cleveland game, his pick in Cleveland. You can just see how comfortable he was get, uh, getting to, like, reading what the offense was doing and getting in the right spot. Um, it was a little sneaky interception he had in that point. He was just so fun to watch at the end. And then, yeah, with Kyler Gordon, Kyler Gordon at nickel. Fantastic. People almost want to avoid Kyler in the middle, too. And so that's even more so why Tyreek was getting so much more. And then I'm a big tea time fan, too. Terrell Smith, I think, was another uh, later hit that uh, Ryan Poles was able to get last year when he had to come in. He was my monster of the week early in the season when some of the defensive backs were banged up. He came in and performed really well. Um, so, yeah, again, depth. And your, your starting three are fantastic. And then your depth also, you're not crazy worried if someone has to miss a game or two. Yeah. No, I mean, and it's deeper. I mean, you know, Jalen Jones, you mentioned, versatile can yeah. also play safety. Um, Greg Stroman, you know, he's a vet yeah. that's played in this he league. He was another before. monster for me last year, too. Yeah, I mean, it, it just keeps going. And, and yeah, I think the the run that, uh, that Tyreek got – 
as people avoided Jalen, you know, it, it, it built his confidence and, um, and it, it showed them, you know, you're going to have to figure out a different way. You're going to have to scheme up plays because you can't attack these DBs um, successfully. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with our, our corner group. Um, I think, I think Spidey might be my favorite player on the team. Um, I know he's fantastic. I, I love his versatility. I think that was a savvy move picking a nickel corner who can also play outside. You know, he's a yep. physical athletic freak and and he'll come up and, and he'll lay the wood. Um, I'm excited about him. One of those things too. Can he stay, can he stay fully healthy all year? Um, he's yeah. been pretty durable, but yeah, I, I love our DBs and, and looking forward yeah. to seeing them take on. Yeah. Let's um, be quick on the, on that, because we had uh, the, our first question of this summer series was players we think will be, take the biggest step. And Tyreek Stevenson was my number one for that. Um, just for the, his last seven games last season, just to show people how good he got in the end of the season. He had a 46.9 completion percentage allowed. He had four interceptions, 11 pass, de pass defended, 48.9 passer rating allowed, three games under 20 yards in that last seven games. That was what Tyreek was able to do. Um, yeah. And it, and to your point earlier, too, when we were talking about safeties, all every single defensive back missed some time last season at some point. They, they all got banged up. So you obviously want them on the field. But to that point, because of that, it did take some time for everybody to really start like meshing together. Mm -hmm. But by the end, the last five, six, seven games, you felt like that secondary was on pace to be a top. And that's why now we're looking at this this roster where we have cornerbacks at the top of our list when it comes to this. So that leads to our number one, which, uh, like I said, I think was everybody's number one other than maybe Lester. Um, but I think, I think someone, someone had corner number one. Um, okay. I, okay. So maybe there was but, a couple people. Yeah, there was a couple. But, yeah, receivers. And I, I just, yeah. you know, just uh, spoiler, I can't wait to see this, ba this battle in training camp. I know. Hard knocks. Like, I can't wait to see these guys. Because Tyreek, think about the end of his season. Yeah. His his confidence is going to be sky high. Oh, Kyler's yeah. confidence is sky high. Jay, and then you got, uh, I think, a Hall of Famer in Keenan Allen. You know, mm -hmm. he this this season he should easily catch up to Chad Johnson in receiving yards overall all time. Um, and I think I think then you have DJ Moore, who I think is might might be one of the most underrated receivers yeah. in the whole league. Um, yeah. And I think should be in the top 100 list that comes out. I think it's next week. The NFL's unveil unveiling that. And like you talked about, Romo Dunze, you know, you got yeah. three blue chip studs at receiver. When's the last time we had that? I don't think we ever have had that. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah, I don't think we have. And yeah. and then you have Valus, you've got Pettis. Um, obviously, guys, you don't want to you don't want to have see too much time out there. But um, but our, our receiver room is stacked. But anytime you've got, you know, a Hall of Famer, potential, I think, perennial pro bowler, at least talent yeah. in DJ, and then a first top 10 pick. Yeah. I don't know if you can beat that a possible so. rookie of the year. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's hard to even argue wide receivers here. I I'm interested to see what Lester and whoever, whoever didn't have wide receivers of what they're, and I'm, I'm sure their argument is valid, maybe more so like if it is corner, for example, mm -hmm. there's a little more there. All of those guys now have experience and you're kind of banking right. on a rookie wide receiver. So maybe that's um, some of the reason for that. But yeah, it's so hard for me not to put them number one. I think that DJ Moore has proven himself every single year <laughs> and with just quarter quarterback that didn't work out after quarterback that didn't work out. He's still able to be sitting towards the top of the league in everything. We saw him get 1300 yards last season, again, an offense that did not pass the ball very often right. um, and had troubles passing the ball in general his yards after contact are absolutely insane when you talk about Keenan Allen he just has everything you want out of a wide receiver um we talk about the route running of Gerald Everett but him too Keenan Allen just what he's able to do uh when it comes to his movement on the football field and his separation that he can create even though he's not the fastest guy by hit by the way he can use his eyes and his hands and his feet right. to kind of like create that separation. Mm -hmm. Roma Dunze, I am absolutely obsessed and I haven't even seen him play. I don't think I've been this excited about a draft pick since Roquan Smith, honestly. And yeah. I was shouting pre-draft, like, please draft Rome, please draft Rome. Yeah. They, I even have a clip like on from here in Jacksonville at where I went on a rant about how I want Roma Dunze over Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. And it like went viral here because everyone's like, she's crazy. And I'm like, he's <laughs> insane. Like his yeah. contested catch rate is incredible. He's going to get that ball. You don't have to worry about like the defensive backs. Get, he'll, he'll be able to fight with them and get the ball in his hands. He's fat. He's fast. He's not the fastest as Malik Neighbors, but he's no. still quick. Um, he's just incredible. He's so much fun to watch. You can play oh, him wow. deep. You can play him outside. You can play him on the inside if you need to. Yep. I just think it's so much fun. And like, beyond, I think when you're looking at this, 
the way I was kind of analyzing would these three guys start on other rosters. And I genuinely think that at least DJ Moore and Keenan Allen would start on 90% of rosters in the NFL. Right. Yeah. And no, absolutely. So, and, and I, that's think, what I kind of value it. Sorry, go ahead. No, honestly, I think Keenan Allen and DJ Moore make me like Rome even more mm -hmm. because, because he now gets to learn behind two yeah. different styles, but savvy professional team leaders that, that take their approach very seriously and have done it well for a long time. So I think this is a position that might not lose its number one spot, at least on my list, you know, yeah. because of Rome, if, if they, if they continue to, to, to grow and, and uh, perform and maybe stack another receiver down the road or whatever. You know, oh, then yeah. we even talk about Tyler Scott, you know, I think yeah, Tyler Scott, can, <laughs> he, can, yeah. he can step up too. I, I, I really liked him at Cincinnati. Um, you know, again, last season, he didn't get as much run, uh, didn't have any pass plays, you know, he yeah. had some, some rookie issues with some drops and whatnot, but, um, but I think he could really turn up this year as well. So I'm, you know, I'm just beyond ecstatic yeah. about receivers. It is. It's wild to go from what we had a few years ago oh, when gosh. we're talking about like Nikhil Harry's and Byron Pringles and Equinemia St. Brown's. And we're trying to convince ourselves like yeah. that was good. like Darnell Mooney is a wide receiver one. And we're arguing yeah. everybody about it. And now we're arguing like, OK, DJ Moore or Keenan Allen. But one of the things because I did a podcast when uh, we traded for Keenan Allen and I was talking to some, uh, one of the guys that works that covers the Chargers. And he was just talking about how, number one, obviously, Keenan Allen's incredible. And he was devastated that they were losing Keenan Allen, not only on the football field, but off the football field. Because he said that Keenan Allen is one of those guys who is a role model to everybody in the building. And he said he would stay after practices to help the corners. Because, like, during practice, if he would burn one of the corners, he'd be like, hey, man, let me tell you what you did wrong on this play. Yeah. And, like, he's that type of guy. So, to your point of him being able to help Rome, he's yeah. also – our defensive back room is also oh, yeah. so young – Hit Kyler and Brisker right. and all of these other guys are also learning from a guy like Keenan Allen. So yeah, it, it's going to be. Um, hopefully, we are all. It's, we're just banking on Caleb. We're like, please just be it. <laughs> you don't even. Yeah. This year, he doesn't even have to be like uh, flawless. He doesn't right. even have to have a CJ Stroud year. I don't think for the offense to look good just because of no. everything they have. But you would love to see that. You would love to see yeah. those moments of like, okay, this is it. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think with our offense, with our weapons, I mean, Tyson Bajan would would do the job. Yeah. And so I, I feel like Caleb's floor has to be Tyson, and I think it's going to be better than that already. But from what I've gathered from Caleb, from interviews and, um, you know, post post practice conferences, he doesn't seem like he's going to be pushing uh, too much as far as um, stepping outside of, of his um, where he should be. He's going to stay within yeah. himself. Um, yeah. as a quarterback. And I think that's all he has to do, especially mm -hmm. in this offense. And so I'm excited for him to do that because if he can, then, I mean, there's going to be so many options out there. Um, it'll be hard to stop. Yeah. And I'm just excited to see like a fun offense. And that's one of the things that not only the weapons, but Shane Waldron will bring, will bring because Luke Gessie's offense was just so boring. It was just um, the most, predictable. so predictable. I felt like, I mean, I – would be watching. I'm like, if I know what you're about to do, the defensive coordinator knows what you're about to do. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, and you know, but you know about football. I've sat with yeah. people watching the games that don't watch football and they're like, why did he do that again? And I'm like, you, you're asking <laughs> me. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how he got a job so quickly, honestly. It's yeah. that, that kind of blew my mind. Um, it's the Aaron but, Rodgers effect. Like, I, I, I just think that anybody that like coached Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers was technically the coach and they just got to look good because right. of Aaron Rodgers. Well, um, and so they. Yeah. To your point, they do have Devontae Adams there, and he might have said something about Luke Getze because I'm pretty sure Getze okay. was his receivers coach early in his career. Um, but but still, I mean, to yeah. hire him as an offensive coordinator after what he did, I, I just – yeah. yeah it's beyond just me. But, but, yeah, Shane Waldron, I'm really excited about him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've had a pretty – speaking of OCs, we've had a pretty rough batch of OCs for our entire history. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if you've gone back, but it's it's kind of depressing. Um, I don't know and, if I want to. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's rough. Like Ron yeah. Turner is one of our best offensive coordinators. Um, yeah. But um, I, I have a spoiler alert coming out yeah. with a, a fun little article later okay. uh, next coming coming weeks. But uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm thrilled about this offense. And, and like we said, most of these positions it were it was hard because they're they're so much better than they've been, and there's so much potential there or depth there. Um, yeah. So it's hard to pick, which is different for us Bears fans. Um, but this, the, the sky is uh, looking clear and yeah. sunny, and, and it's an exciting um, time to be a Bears fan. <laughs> 
All right, Brian. Well, thanks so much for hopping on with me. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Yeah, it's fun. We'll do it again. Thanks, Taylor. Yep, have a good one.